Um, tell us about that tattoo, the bee. The bee? All right, so I was a beekeeper up until April of 2019, where I took uh, two stingers to the knee. I was not even in front of my hives. Um, but my tongue went numb, my heart rate shot up to 225, and all of my tattoos got raised, and I was no longer allowed to be a uh, beekeeper, because if I died because of bees, my wife would kill me. Was that your first time being stung? Nope. I would get stung multiple times a day. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, but I got hit with a bald face hornet on the temple, um, and I went into full-on anaphylaxis. But if nobody ever tells you, your butt starts to itch, your palm starts to itch, you start sweating from places you didn't know sweat would come out of. And my heart rate shot up, my whole face got swollen. Got to get a ride by the lovely Aurora Fire Department from my pharmacy over to Mercy. Um, and they did three doses of epinephrine in the uh, ambulance. And I had to do a whole bunch of steroids after. And I don't react well with steroids. I can't sleep, I can't think. So it was either run the risk of dying and pissing my wife off or dropping the bees. So yeah, I, I became fascinated with bees. Uh, on a trip to Russia in 2002, and I became a beekeeper in 2010, and then 2019 was supposed to be like my 10th season. What was the fascination with bees? Um, the fact that you can coexist and not even realize that they were there. I was at a greenhouse in Moscow, and it was like negative 20 Celsius outside. And we're inside this huge freaking industrial warehouse where they're growing food. And they had like this trough system where these long rows of like lettuces and cucumbers and shit were all just kind of planted out. And then they had people that were just kind of doing all this stuff. And I'm, I'm, I just, I didn't get it. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm like, how do you do this stuff inside when it's so freaking cold? And I was like, my friends used to grow pot in college and they had this mitten and they would go by and they would literally stroke off the plants to move the pollen from the pistol and stamen, right? right? And I remember that being a thing that they would do. They'd either shake or they would pull. Well, I was like, I don't get this. And I went to the translator, Olga. I'm like, wait a minute, how are they pollinating these? Do they have a glove? And she's like, no, the bees. And it was like this, oh. And they had like this orange hued room, like a silo in the center of the room right. where they had beehives stacked up all the way, like 30 feet in the air. And they had this door that was on a timer and it would open for the blooms. And then the bees after time would understand at eh, time to get done, all the watermelons have been freaking pollinated and they would close the door, let them sit for a day or two, then open them onto the greens. And I'm like, that's freaking crazy. So I became like, that's, that's dope. And then everywhere we went, I was in Tim, Timur Yazov. Russia, where it was the first place on the planet where they successfully artificially inseminated a queen bee. And me being the kid, going, <laughs> the translator's like, you're going to be our beekeeper. Yeah. She would love to be And then she totally freaking nailed it. Like, I ended up going. And at the time, I was playing guitar for a rap group out of Chicago called Rubber Room. And I was doing these rehearsals for this huge festival we were doing in Minnesota called Soundset. And I saw this little, this ad from Obansi, you know, a $19 beekeeping class. Dude, and I told my sister, she said, I'll go. So she goes, she goes, you would love this guy. It's not for me, but you would totally love this guy. So I, instead of taking like an hour class, I took an eight hour class and I was like, bruh, use me. So I like immediately became this dude's free labor. I just wanted to learn. And it became like an obsession of mine, you know, like I'm not as much a honey snob anymore because I can't get in there and taste it seasonally as it changes. Sure. But honey is just one of those things where a little bit you can sit with that flavor. You can totally dive in on how, like the nuances of the different types of pollen. Like when I found out that early summer honey tastes like mint, because what's the predominant weed in these freaking, you know, all the, the on the side of the road, cat mint is the predominant weed mm -hmm. in where my, my hives were. So my, my honey would taste a little minty in the summer. Like, what is this? And then like August honey, it's like Winnie the Pooh shit. It just tastes like what textbook definition of honey is supposed to taste like, right? But then you get into like September honey, bruh. As the trees and the leaves darken, the pollen gets more complex. And what's the predominant weed around here? Goldenrod. Goldenrod smells like sweat socks, but holy crap, does it make a crack of a honey? It's like blonde. Yeah, but it makes it like super dark and rich. And even though it's like a yellow, yellow pollen, they're matched with all the other browns around the area. It turns into like this caramely butterscotch crack. And that's where you can end up getting a stomachache from eating literally a pound of honey because it's like, I can't stop. I mean, it's just, so I became really, really passionate about those flavors. And then I would get like my friend, Brian Fisher, um, he's a Michelin star chef in Chicago. And he came out before he was a Michelin chef. Uh, Cause I used to have my friends help me spin honey. That shit's exhausting. So he comes out and he's all quiet. And I remember going, all right, now lick your finger. And I remember his face. Cause I was just with him the other day. He puts his finger in the frame looks at me like, are you serious? And puts it in his mouth and his whole, like his whole body went relaxed, like oh <laughs> full body goosebumps. So right. again, if you think that the brain and the body aren't talking, You're wrong. we're wrong. 
There is no separation between the two. Like if a taco can give me goosebumps and honey can give me freaking goosebumps, obviously the way that I feel can impact my physical health and vice versa. Right. right. Dude, honey was like, it was this thing that like my wife knew like, all right, when Joel's got a hyper focus with his ADHD, you kind of got to let it go or you're going to run the risk of, you know, making me go in even harder. Right. right. But these small containers of honey are still in my cabinet. And like, yeah, they, they crystallize, but I, I'll fill my whole sink up with warm water and just shake them and try to decrystallize it. Because remember, honey does not go bad. They found honey in King Tut's tomb and it was still edible. You just right. got to use a hot water bath to warm it up. Because once it goes sub 72 or 68 Fahrenheit ambient room temperature dips, it's going to crystallize. That's what honey does. But it's perishable. Like you, as long as you got a lid on that shit, eat it. And we like cooking with crystallized honey because it doesn't spill. I knew that that had honeycomb in a bee. Yeah. Don't ask about the broccoli though. This is like, yeah. Right, this, is, this is the bacon. <laughs> oh, it's that's five cool. pieces of bacon, one for each member of my family. That's awesome. Okay, it's supposed quick. to be the final piece. Real quick, little word association. Mm -hmm. Say name. First thing that comes to mind. Julie Frieders. I that's got, a word. I, I, <laughs> I'll I, take it. That, that, that's a word. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I might be one of the few people who is like incredibly sexually attracted to his wife, um, and she knows it. Um, and I make sure that she knows that like, I've, I literally married the woman in my dreams and I apologize to her that I'm not the man of her dreams. But like when I thought back when I was a kid, man, I want to marry a woman like this. I literally found her and wifed her the hell up and I win like, all the freaking time. She's organized. She makes way more money than I do. Um, she's an amazing mom, like incredibly motherly. She, she's thoughtful, which like drives me crazy. Cause like, damn it. Why didn't I think of doing that for right. someone? She's incredibly popular. She's the best. Yeah, she loves the hell out of her friends, which is cool. It was more than one. It was. Uh, Dan Emerson. Hugs. Hugs. Yeah. I've, I've trusted Dan Emerson with things that I don't think I've even told myself. Dude's an amazing guy. Gillerson's is one of my favorite places because it's meant to, it's, it's, it's like the conversation on mental health before for the day. It's going to be accessible. Shout out to Gillerson's. Hell yeah. Jeremy Jensen. I want to be more like Jeremy Jensen um, every day. Like the fact that sometimes he pisses me off because he asks for my help and I say, okay, how do I do that? And he says, never mind, I'll take care of it. It's because he has the same issues that I have where I know how to do a whole bunch of shit. And sometimes it's easier just to do it myself. Uh, but I think Jeremy is going to save the planet. Mike Mancuso. Mike Mancuso is literally my dream uh, animal. Like he is spirit animal, excuse me. Like I've always wanted to work in my creative space and the fact that he can work in his creative space while still kind of dealing with life's, you know, frustrations. Um, I think Mike Mancuso is Aurora's Willy Wonka. And if we're not reveling in the fact that a person like that exists and provides jobs to the community and participates in literally everything that I do, even though he's got all the reasons in the world to hate me because I still can't open the friggin' arcade for him on Broadway. It's like, I love that guy with every ounce of my being and then some just an amazing human. Amazing. Human. Thank you. Hell yeah. Thanks for having me. Keys to Megan's. I'm bringing the, keys, the keys to, to Megan's. <laughs> Excellent interview. Excellent. Joel, man, thanks for being oh, us. Hell yeah. It was good to meet you, man. Hell yeah.